I'm here basically to talk about, um, on Verinda's invitation, um, my teacher training work that I've been doing on Celsa courses mostly in Germany. Um, have any of you worked in Germany ever? No? Okay. Um, well, I'm based up in Hamburg some of the time, Berlin most of the time. And so I'd like to spend about half an hour or so telling you a little bit about the last five or six years of my work and floating some questions as I go along and then open up for questions from you, if that's okay. Um, a couple of, couple of quick questions from me though to start with. Um, can I assume that you're all familiar with terms like dogma, ELT, teaching unplugged, emergent language, lovely. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So I can skip the first 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, um, I trained as a CELTA tutor, I guess back in 2003, 2004. Um, are you, you're all CELTA tutors, right? Everyone here? Yes. No? Hands up CELTA tutors. Okay, DELTA tutors? Teachers? <laughs> Getting you all. Uh, do you work on, if you're not working on CELTA courses at the minute, are you working on other teacher development, teacher training courses, bits and pieces? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. A lot of what I have to say relates directly to CELTA courses, but hopefully it's applicable more broadly. Um, I trained up in Berlin with a former IH uh, director of studies from years and years and years ago. None of you perhaps know a guy called Dominic Braham. He used to be, I think, a director of studies in IH London when it was... I think even before Piccadilly, um, years and years and years ago. And he had a CELTA centre in Berlin and I trained up. And one of the things that Dominic was really great at was being really careful to try and make things as simple as possible for the trainees on the courses so that they didn't get overloaded. Right? Because you've all done a CELTA course yourself, right? Probably. And you remember that experience of just being very quickly overloaded by work. Mm. And he was really intent on minimizing the chances of students or trainees getting overwhelmed with work and stressed and so on, because he couldn't stand the thought of anyone getting stressed while he was working with them. So he had systems in place to get over this, and he had documents in place to get over this. And as I was training up, I thought these were great. There was so much pre-course information, it told you exactly what you had to do and how and when. You had weekly little reminders of this is what you have to do and by when and this is the best time to do it. Had templates, had handbooks, had more templates, had more handbooks. And everything ran really well, really smoothly. Um, but there was always still this overload. So after a while when I trained up and I learned how these things worked, Dominic and I used to sit down and say, how can we make it even simpler? And so we created more systems, more handbooks, more templates. <laughs> Simplified the templates, expanded the templates. Right? If you printed out all of this stuff, I guess it would probably be, I don't know, floor to here, something like that. Um, and we thought we were doing a good thing here. We were convinced that we were doing a good thing. And the trainees we worked with were convinced we were doing a good thing. They were very grateful. They said, this support is wonderful. There's loads of support, there's loads of information, but we're still overwhelmed. And after a year or two, I found my feet as a trainer, and I started to think, well, this is just the way it is, isn't it? I mean, four weeks, learning to become a teacher, it's going to be overwhelming. That's, that's it. And then I had the lucky chance to take on a head of teacher training role in Hamburg and I moved up north with my family and I modeled the center then in in my own image right? and that involved systems that involved paperwork that involved handouts that involved handbooks that involved templates and the course ran increasingly well right? we were in Germany so I think an appropriate analogy would be if I am not being too uh, immodest, like a finely tuned BMW. <laughs> the course purred. Right? And everyone said so. You know, the trainees loved it, the assessors loved it, they all said the same thing. Really clear systems, really clear timetable, really clear this, really clear that. The results were good too. 
certainly on par with international averages. We were very happy with that. Feedback was always great. Um, but there was always still this underlying sense of overload. There's so much to take on board, there's so much that's new, and we just couldn't crack it. But we got everything else in line, thought, okay, that's the price you pay for trying to learn to be it, being a teacher in, in four weeks, right? And then a former um, colleague of yours here, a guy called David Carr, who some of you might know, might remember, he came to assess one time. Now, David Carr was my Delta tutor here. <laughs> so when he came to assess my courses in Hamburg, I was nervous, to say the least. <laughs> what is he going to say? And at the end of the meeting, at the end of the, the visit, he sat there and he said, well, Anthony, all very, very nice, very clear, very this, very this, and there. the feedback was all wonderful, fine, tick. And then he sat back and he said, but you know what I miss? I said, I don't know, what? He said, where's the human messiness? I thought, sorry. He said, you know, the human messiness, where's, where's that? You know, I think one of, the, one of the reasons you might be feeling that this is so stressful in some ways is because there's no, there's no give room here. And that, that hurt, <laughs> because he was right, he was absolutely right. Um, and he made me realize that um, the problem with systems is that when they don't work, you think you need more of them to get things right, and that's not always the case. So I was left with a problem now. I had a wonderfully functioning course that I wasn't happy with anymore, and I didn't know how to change it, because it was working. And then I did what anyone who has a problem like that probably should do, is I went to a conference. Um, <laughs> or I got a phone call. <laughs> I went to a conference. I went to Cardiff IATFL 2008, 2009. Were any of you there? And it was a very interesting conference, but one very important thing happened there. Uh, Luke Meddings and Scott Thornbury launched that book, Teaching Unplugged, which was the combination of 10 years or so, or five years, 10 years at that point, of working on dogma. I went to the book launch, there were like 400 people in the hall, like, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they in introduced the book, have you read it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I got my hands on it, I thought, oh, this looks nice. And during the questions I asked, do you think you can train teachers from scratch to work this kind of way? And I was hoping that he'd say, oh, yes, of course, like this. Right? And he didn't. He said, I don't know. Um, no idea. Maybe. Maybe not. So I went back to Hamburg and I thought, OK, I'm going to try. So my colleague and I, Izzy, Izzy Ord, decided to throw away our course and start from scratch. Now, before I move on with my story, a little bit of pair work. I can't resist it, I'm too tepid <laughs> for this. With your neighbour, so two, 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 three. Here's a thought experiment. You get to create the assessment criteria for an initial teacher training course. You get to define what an A grade candidate would display, what, what characteristics they would display, what skills they would have. What would your top three be? Over to you, one minute. Yeah, like flexibility, Okay, can I stop you there? I just like to hear some of what, what was your what was your first one? Kind of the same, wasn't it? It was about um, student engagement and responding to students. Mm. Uh, that Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about flexibility, spontaneity, improvisation, that kind of being able to just uh -huh. be more flexible, basically. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Did that come up? Okay. How about yours? Uh, knowledge of language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's knowing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we talked about um, being comfortable, being in front of the class, having presence. Ah, okay. 
Mm -hmm. That could be it. Yeah, connect to that red pool at the end. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking how do you... Yeah. Right, yeah. And how do you train it? Mm -hmm. Being interested in the students, we said. It's very mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. kind of ring mm -hmm. Yeah, love it. I said tangible evidence of learning. Um, okay. <coughs> Those are all good. And we had similar thoughts as well. When it came down to it for us, the three things that, that we decided we were going to prioritise because we thought that they were the most important things for excellence in teaching as we saw it. And excellence in teaching we described as teaching that we would like to have inflicted on us, <laughs> ourselves was we wanted our teachers to be able to listen um, really listen um, and be able to work on what I'm trying to say in ways that make sense to me and be able this was the last one to conceive lessons and strings of lessons independently yeah. those were the three big things um, and we thought if that's important then our timetable needs to reflect that our teaching needs to reflect that our course needs to reflect that everything needs to be geared to fostering inculcating and fostering those three things at least, plus loads of other things, but those are the things we're going to hit hard, or try to hit hard, because they matter to us. And what really hurt was when we looked back at our timetable, the one that had been so successful and worked so well, and we looked at week one, I couldn't see any of those three things really in week one at all. I could see them later, but that's too late. I think over here in your conversations, I'm not sure if it was over here or over here, you were talking about um, some things are really hard to learn. I think you were saying that. It's, um, one of the things no, you were saying, so oh yeah? Oh, okay, one of, it was kind of hard to, some, some skills are hard to acquire. Well, Which we was were, it? We were talking about the responsiveness and listening mm -hmm. and engaging students. But it, we were saying it's oh, when you've been teaching for a long time, it becomes sort of an instinct. You don't right. really think about it. Yeah. So when you then try to train someone in how to do it, yeah. it's quite difficult to think of mm -hmm. how you would tell them to do it. Just, just listen to them, you know? But <laughs> it's not that easy for some people. Right. Neither is it to really respond to them or understand what they're saying or. All of that, so it's quite mm. difficult to train that aspect of it. Yeah, and that was um, that was our concern as well. Like, can these things be trained? But we decided to worry about that later, and um, just to crack on and try and do it. So we decided to look at what could we, in inverted commas, unplug in a CELTA course. There are some things you can't, right? The administration, the requirement of having a certain number of assignments, a certain number of hours, and so on. But there are two basic things you can start pulling wires out of. One is input, one is teaching practice, okay? So what we decided to do in terms of input, if I can remind myself, was, this is where you can all rightly criticize my board writing. We decided to think about these three principles of unplugged teaching that Scott and Luke came up with years back. Do you remember what those three things are? Dogma equals A, B, C equals... <laughs> oh, you said you'd read the book. Yeah. <laughs> oh, materials. Yeah. Materials. Materials light. Thank you. Yeah. Conversation Com driven. Yeah. And? Something else. Focus on emergent. Language. Right. <laughs> we decided to, to shamelessly rip off those three ideas and, and repurpose them. So we decided to have input sessions were going to become paper-like practice rich. We got this down to the point where the entire of week one, um, by the Friday of week one, we'd given out one piece of paper for the whole of the week. 
<coughs> and practice rich. We made sure that in the input sessions they were practicing the things that we were talking about. Because teaching practice is in fact a misnomer. Right? There's no such thing as teaching practice. It's teaching. Why? Because most of the time, if you're working on a five or a six TP group course, every time they teach more or less, they're being assessed. Right? From that point of view, teaching practice is not the place necessarily to practice things. So get it into input or put it somewhere else. So that was one of the ideas that we, that we had. The other thing was, we were going to talk a lot more in input. And when I say we, I meant they. So we used to have quite a lot of mini lectures. We assumed we had the information, they didn't. We transmitted a lot. We scrapped that, we demonstrated, and we had them talk a lot. I'm sure you're doing a lot of these things. This is nothing new, but it was a bit of a change for us at the time. And when you're working a lot of courses, um, and when you're trying to simply keep on top of work, it is easier to do things in ways that you're familiar with. And this was not so familiar for me at the time. And this is the one that a lot of people that I talked to four or five years ago when we were just starting to do this really didn't like the idea of was the focus on emerging teaching ideas. What I mean by that was Izzy and I, my colleague, decided that in input, if an idea, a teaching, an idea about teaching methodology or pedagogy or something like that didn't arise as a question or a comment from the, te from the trainees, we weren't going to introduce it ourselves. Right. That must be the sales and marketing one. It's a double booking. So basically what that meant was, uh, again, a quick test, CCQs are? That's a checking question. ICQs? Checking, checking. Right, that kind of stuff. Not only these labels, but these concepts, these ideas, we weren't going to introduce them and assume that the trainees were going to learn them and apply them in teaching until something came up from the group, like Richard, if you were on the course, you might say, I think I'm telling them clearly what to do, and then they're just screwing it up, my students. It's not my fault. How can I get around this? How can I solve this problem? Well, how might you? Well, maybe you should ask them whether they've understood you or not. Mean, okay, and then the concept comes into circulation. So we don't have a session where certain ideas are introduced necessarily. We have points in the course at which a need arises, and then the idea is introduced. They can then practice it in teaching practice and go from there. People don't like this idea because the basic problem, what if the idea never comes up and it's important? I haven't seen that happen yet. 12, 15 people, all of the teaching going on, typical teaching problems arise, conversation about those typical teaching problems having arisen will lead inevitably, I think, to the emergence of such a syllabus, if you're patient. And this was the challenge for me and Izzy, was being patient enough to wait for that moment to happen, so that when Richard or whoever in the group needed that input or that stimulus from someone else or from us, he was then ready for it. Whereas a week before, a day before, he may not have been. Have you ever had this training someone where you tell them to do something, it goes in, they say yes, makes sense, mm -hmm. and they never, never act on it? Because so they weren't ready to, one might argue. <coughs> this was an idea we had to try and avoid that problem. So that was what we did. And then we, when we looked at our input schedule, the very first thing we did in input was we trained our TP student, uh, our trainees how to listen. We literally had them have a mingle. Izzy and I would monitor them just as we would any other student group. We gave them language feedback afterwards. We talked to them about what we'd just done. And then we organized them in groups, initially pairs, then trios, then quads, then whole class mingles, and practiced their listening skills, their teacher listening skills. 
recording verbatim what they were hearing. Then looking at this language and thinking about what was interesting in that language, even though it was accurate. How might they talk to students about that language to help them learn something about it and then practice that in following sessions. And then in the afternoon when they met the students for the first time, they did exactly that. They set up mingles, they monitored them, they captured language, they talked to the students about it in pairs or groups and just helped teach the students a little bit informally about the language they were using. And this continued throughout the whole course. The underlying motor in the course is training teachers to listen, to capture accurately what someone has said, and to find ways of making it better, and then find ways of talking to that person so that they understand how they can make it better, and then go from there. Now this has two branches that come off here. One is to teaching practice, because the next decision we made was to ditch teaching practice points. Do you remember teaching practice points? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, you have to spend weeks maybe typing them up or finding them in the computer and just lifting them from a previous course. Yeah? But I never liked teaching practice points because I'd spend ages writing them and then watch trainees do something completely at odds <laughs> with what I'd suggested in my teaching practice points. And I wondered why this was happening. Was I that bad a writer? Is the material that obtuse? No. The problem was that the trainees hadn't conceived it themselves. And it's harder to understand somebody else's way of thinking and somebody else's ideas than your own. Your own ideas may not be good. Your own ideas may not be right. But they make sense to you and you can operationalize them more easily and less stressfully than somebody else's. Right? I assert that. Now, as soon as you give somebody a teaching practice point, information about what to teach and how, and you give them materials, you're presenting them with a problem. Make sense of somebody else's idea quickly, often overnight, and make it your own and teach it. That's obviously going about it the hard way, it occurred to me later. So we decided to scrap them. No teaching practice points. Teaching practice one is on day two of the course. We do give them a little speaking activity for that. Very simple. But from teaching practice two on, two through eight, we don't give them any teaching practice points. We don't give them any material. We don't give them anything. I see some faces being... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> we did that as well at the beginning. We thought, is this going to work? Right. Well, it does. And it's interesting looking at what some of, um, some of your colleagues or former colleagues are doing here. Uh, like Danny Norrington Davis at Manchester IATF from last year talked about what he's doing with reading lessons, I think, primarily, with giving authentic text packs to his trainees and having them create lessons just based on these authentic texts. And also, I'll have to check the names I have here, because I missed this talk and I'm gutted I missed it uh, because of a colleague of mine went to see it and said it was good. Johanna or Johanna Stansfield and Emma Mead, Flynn. Well done. I'm really sorry I missed it. But your whole thesis of what if you remove the, uh, the language input from, from, from input, we did that too. We stripped out all of the, the language awareness sessions to make more space for talking about pedagogy and teaching and let the, the language awareness build up over time in the same way. And a really important part of that is having them take language notes, having them listen, having them think about the language that they're hearing from their students, and making that language the language that they then try and teach in their teaching practice lessons. So where do the lessons come from? All of the language-focused lessons come from the notes that they've been taking in the first couple of days, and the language issues that are revealed through those. So they start to see when they pull their language notes, okay, this seems to be a problem area, this is a lexical gap area, this is pronunciation area, let's divide this up between us and plan out for week two, because we put all of the actual language systems lessons <coughs> into week two, let's plan these out and divide it up and go from there. Reading and listening, 
similar to what Danny is doing, but slightly more radical, we just say, you're an interesting person, you've had a lot of life experience. Can you think of any interesting stories that you'd be willing to share with your students that would be like okay to tell <laughs> and wouldn't take more than two, three minutes? They get together in little storytelling groups, come up with little anecdotes about a time when X, create them, and then we say, okay, great. Now, what's the human interest heart of this story? You may be told a story that's quite specific, about this, 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 this. But the general human interest in it, just like in a course book, can be extracted, and other people can then tell stories similar to it. Okay, there we've got a speaking and a listening or reading lesson. We need some tasks, okay. What would be a good reason for listening to this story? What would be a good reason for speaking? Uh, for, for reading it. Okay, can we think about how we could design that? How can we get into this? Do you have any photos connected with that? Do you have any things at home you could bring in? Just start building these things up so that lesson two, TP2, is a reading and speaking lesson based on an anecdote of their own. And many of the trainees continue throughout the course. They teach three receptive skills lessons during the course, primarily receptive skills. They keep basing them on stories of their own or stories that they find, and then they craft these little texts and tasks to do with them, and go from there. The same with writing lessons, the same with language focus lessons. We, of course, have to bring in the idea of things like generative situations, text-based exploitations. But as soon as you've got a bunch of trainees who've created stories, you look at the language that's in those stories, and then you use that as a way of modeling how a text-based presentation could work using their own stories. Or bring in an idea of a generative situation or something like that, if you needed to. <coughs> so the input and the teaching practice become kind of inexorably linked. And so the teaching practice if I remind myself again, basically became no teaching practice points. And the language that was taught was dictated by the language the trainees had noticed. And again, this principle that if you notice something, you're more liable to be able to work with it. If they look at something and think, that's not right, and they can hypothesize about why, they can do some research, they can find out how that bit of language works. We can help them develop a language focus stage, find practice or make practice tasks. Because if you ask a, a typical person, if you want to practice X, how many ways can you think of, of doing it? Put three or four people in a bunch, give them 10 minutes, they'll come up with gap fill, they'll come up with mixing, they'll come up with ordering, they'll come up with find the error, they'll come up with have little conversation frames, etc, etc. They'll come up with these ideas, I guarantee it. And then when you open a course book and say, okay, find examples of those ideas somewhere here, they'll see them. But they wouldn't see them in quite the same way if you just opened this up and said find language practice tasks because they know what they're looking for. Okay, so teaching practice points, no. Learner needs with a focus for the language. The language selections in the teaching practice lessons was the language they'd noticed the learners needed from day one. Okay. With me so far? Okay. Now, I don't particularly want to talk you through like all of the intricacies of my course because that'd be very boring. Um, but I hope that I've got the idea across of what we've tried to do is to make everything depend on everything else and to build from the things that are hard, which, and I think listening and hearing what somebody wants to say, really wants to say, is hard. Much, much harder than most people think. 
identifying language needs, even when it's not obvious, is hard. And teach, planning lessons independently, truly independently, without any material, without anyone telling you how to do it, because I'm telling is hard. Right? So you start in week one, right? and you do it continuously all the way through. You ditch the stuff you don't need, like teaching practice points, like all kinds of other things, and you allot more time to the conversations that need to happen to let this work. So how many hours a day on the CELTA course here is there for input? Three. Three? Mm. Yeah. three. That's quite typical. We had three, we shaved it down to two. We put the extra hour into teaching practice guidance and feedback because that's where we think the motor is. So we have two, two, two mm. on our courses. Right? Input, guidance, feedback, TP, um, for example. So I'm just going to sort of come to the end of my little mini lecture, ramp, diatribe, whatever, with seven ideas for, for pulling the wires out. And then I'll let you guys talk to each other a little bit and see what you'd like to ask me or ask each other or tell me. And then we can have just a conversation. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So seven ideas. Number one, ditch your timetable. <laughs> Throw it out completely. Get it, I mean, not completely completely, but just get it out of sight, get yourself a blank piece of paper and re-envision what you do. That was the single biggest thing that helped us. The second thing connected with that, work back from results. Work back from the results you want. We defined for ourselves what we wanted by the end of a course and then everything else we did or chose to do was working back from getting there. When we designed our course initially, we made the mistake of not doing that. We made the mistake of starting with the administration handbook and the syllabus and building from there. No. The third thing, start with what trainees can do and move on when they're able to do something new. <coughs> the reason we start with listening and speaking is because doing it like a teacher is hard. But doing it like a normal human being is easy. Right? <clears throat> Do your trainees find it difficult to monitor students when they're having speaking tasks? Yeah. Yeah? What's the single biggest um, sort of complaint or reason they give for why they can't do it? I can't hear, I can't hear them. Can't right, hear them exactly. Saying. Get that a lot initially, but I can't hear them, all these people talking. I said, all right, imagine you're in a bar, you're on a bus, you're in a cafe, you're sitting having a cup of tea, and behind you, you hear a voice you recognize, and they're talking about you. Can you hear the rest of the conversation? Yes. Right. Say, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is it right? Apply the same <laughs> human skill to the classroom. Right. They have the skills. They simply need to learn how to apply them. Number four, ask them what they think. What if the reasons we expanded time in the middle of the day was to find out what each trainee thought about teaching. It occurred to me after a couple of years as a trainer that I didn't ask my trainees half enough what they thought was important about teaching or not, about learning or not. And once we got that out, once I knew what you thought you thought about teaching or learning or language, when you made it explicit to me. And then when I watched you at work, then I could have an interesting conversation with you and say, it's interesting, you say, but you do. Are these in alignment or not? I realized that I often didn't have conversations with my trainees about what they believed about teaching. And the more I do that, the more I think I foster not only my understanding of them, and so I can talk to them in ways that they understand, but more importantly, I foster in them a way of thinking explicitly about their own beliefs, which I think is important right from the very beginning. The next one, stop writing TP points. Just, just don't write them, they're a waste of time. Not for everybody. Not for everybody, but in the 120 odd trainees I work with every year, I'd say maybe four really need TP points and need them most of the time. Right? 
That's, that doesn't justify assuming prematurely a need for everybody else. I've decided it's much more efficient to let people have a go, see what they can do, and then provide them with support if they need it, rather than give them the support like a plaster cast on both legs for three weeks and then remove them at the last stretch and then say, okay, off you go. That's not going to work, I think. So ditch your TP points. Stop asking for lesson plans is another thing. Just don't ask them. At least for the first two lessons. And after that, just ask them to give you bits of lesson plans for assessment. Fade in the assessment of teaching lesson plans over a much longer period of time and it becomes a much less stressful and more productive exercise. They can be writing them, but there's no reason looking at the admin handbook or anything else why there has to be full lesson plans from TP1 or even TP2. It's just not there. You can find ways of drip feeding this focus in over a much longer period. And one last thing that I do a bit, but my colleague Guy Enriquez, uh, who some of you may know, um, does a lot more, is teach with them. And I mean that quite literally. During their teaching practice lessons, have moments in the lesson where you, as an observing tutor, teach with the trainee. To give you one example of how Guy does that, in the first week, listening and noticing language is one thing, but being able to do post-task corrective feedback at the board, that's a different matter. Right? So what he does is, he says, OK, in your lesson, when you've collected enough language during the mingle or during the task or whatever, before you stop them, come to me. We'll agree which ones you're happy to, to try and tackle, which ones you'd like to see tackled, and then we'll both go up and we'll trade off. I'll do some language feedback, you'll do some language feedback, and we'll team teach the feedback stage in the first couple of lessons. Everyone else gets a good model. The trainee gets to see very up close how an experienced teacher does it. And they get to try it out themselves with a very big safety net. And over time, they can just take on more of that work because they've <coughs> experienced how it's done. There's obviously a, a, pro, a prohibition in the Delta handbook about observing tutors working with Delta trainees. There's no such prohibition as far as I'm aware in the CELTA handbook. I certainly don't recommend it going all the way through to TP8 or 9 or whichever is your last one. But I see absolutely no reason in having moments like that where you help trainees get over barriers or get over difficult work if they ask you to. You can certainly make yourself available to do that. So I think that's my last of these seven ideas. Ditch a timetable, work back from results, start with what they can do, talk to them about what they think, ditch TP points, substantially ditch lesson plans if you can get away with it, and do more teaching with them. I hope that's provocative enough. I'd like to leave you for a minute or two to see what we think of all of this and think of questions or comments, okay? Three minutes or so, okay? And then back to group. Over to you. Yeah. I use them for a couple of years, and I use daily, daily card recommendations. So I stopped using them because basically um, I can't write them. And they don't, because it, it's exactly as you were saying, it doesn't match what your expectations are of what, the lesson, uh, what happens in the lesson. So. Prioritise practice of things over other things. So I end up having to, I don't know, I end up, I, I end up very time aligned. I find it like too much. Uh, it's, it's too language heavy as opposed to skills, and also you know, um, you, you're observing from the learners so you turn that into language assignments sometimes. So you don't necessarily need a formalised language assignment, which I've got discrete items that they can have the context for. And uh, maybe the skills assignment, the same could come out an anecdote or something, or come out, I don't know. Can I stop you there? I'd be interested to, to hear 
maybe not questions necessarily to start with, but some of the some of the ideas that you've been sort of coming up with as well. I mean, Richard, if you don't mind me no, putting you on the spot, I just heard you talking about something very interesting to do with assignments. Would you mind? Um, yeah, no, I was just thinking because because the I think the training to listen is really really important and it's it is a skill um, and I, I, I incorporate that in my course. But I was just thinking maybe from what they pick up from the learner language that they pick up, that could maybe form the basis of the language assignment. So actually maybe they, they, through, through language, maybe you could conflate the, the focus on the learner and the language assignment, and it could be, I don't know, yeah. but maybe, the, maybe it could come from there, from the learners. Yeah, I think it's what great. they notice about where the gaps are in the learner's knowledge. Yeah. I think it's a great idea, and it's something that I've been very kind of slack about following up on, is the idea of radically changing the assignments to, to reflect this ethos as well. I think it, you could very easily create a, a skeleton set of instructions for mm. how to get from a bit of observed language to an analysis, to some solution, and so on. Mm. Certainly the, the focus on the learner, obviously, would also feed into that mm. nicely. And you can conflate assignments mm. as well. So I think that's, that's an idea well worth pursuing. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Any others? No? And questions, maybe? Questions or comments? So at the risk of going on, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. please do. start me off there. Yeah, go for uh, it. I've been on holiday for a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, course books. So I mean, you know, an argument. I remember when I saw you talk a few years ago at Harrogate. Oh yeah, you was, were there. Was that um, course books um, trainees should be should be uh, learn how to use course books because yeah. that's what they might be yeah. expected to use beyond the course. How, how do you integrate that? Basically, about halfway through the course, um, at the changeover stage, we do these days, we didn't for several years, but these days we um, give them a piece of material from a course book um, and say, you can use this if you like for your first lesson with a new level, you don't have to. And we've f oscillated between two ways of moving on from there. One way was we just left it up to them. If they wanted to continue making their own stuff, they could. If they wanted to continue exploiting uh, a given course book they could. The other way was actually saying that in the second half of the course you should work together as a group to basically plan, certainly the last week, they plan the entire of the last week collaboratively themselves, so all their lessons interlock, and they do it based on you know, a given course book or course books of their own selection. And so we're starting to play with that idea, so drip feeding in this idea of working with somebody else's material. I'm not sure how much I like that uh, personally, but it's an alternative way of doing it. So this idea of start with yourself, and once you understand how you think and how that relates to teaching principles and so on, start having a look at other people's material, and then towards the end of the course actually, your challenge is now to get inside the head of this author and prove at least once, whether it be TP7 or TP8, that you can implement somebody else's stuff in a way that makes sense. Which I think is, is a really tough trick. So rather than starting them with that and then asking them to wean themselves off it, <laughs> kind of do the opposite. Um, so those are different ways that we've been playing with it. Have yeah. you had feedback, for, sorry, from previous, just connected yeah. to that last point about yeah. from trainees who've gone off into the world yeah. and yeah. then struggled to go into perhaps a school yeah. that has a very uh, rigid yeah. um, um, class fit thing, yeah. book that they have to follow, trying then yeah. to kind of fit into that and saying, no, it's cool, I'm going to make my own stuff. And the director of studies being like, no, you're going to use yeah. this book. Yeah. I haven't had any feedback quite of that type. That doesn't mean to say that they're not running mm. into that problem. What I have had though are um, one or two trainees who already have teaching experience in specific settings who come to the course and they say, the typical quote is something like, I really enjoy what I'm doing here, but when I go back home, mm -hmm. right? I'm like, yeah, well, okay, but when you go back home, you will know how to do what you're doing back home. You'll know how to do some of it differently, and maybe by your own lights better. Yeah. You can't necessarily implement everything that we're doing here. Mm. But that's okay, because if you ever move, mm. and you have the opportunity, you now at least can. Um, and which they also generally see as well. But I haven't had that, that problem. Mm. But 
I do have um, slightly more frequently people at the beginning of the course who simply like to be told what to do and how to do it. Mm. You know, mm. give me some stuff, give me some instructions, let me implement that and test me on that. And after a while, when you see, okay, well, try, just try to do this this way. You think, okay, that's not for you. Okay, you can bring in a different way of working for that person that works for them better. Um, but that, again, is a minority. Mm. Uh, it's much more often that people, to give you a story from the end of one, the, the very first course like this we ran, uh, one of our trainees, um, on the very, very last day of the course, after everything had been finished and, and, and they were having their, you know, Zekt is German champagne, um, and he, he said, um, it came out in conversation that in other centres they have teaching practice points or whatever, and he said, hang on, I've just heard that in other centres it works differently, and I explained how in other centres they do this, this, this. I just described it. You get a teaching practice point, you get a course book, and blah, 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 and, and so on, and it, and he's just looked at me with increasing kind of, I don't quite know what the word is, but his face scrunched up. And he said at the end, that's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think just says, you know, whatever you experience, like I think you were saying, you, the tutors you have on your first day, they're like gods. And the way that you experience a course on a CELTA is the only way you'll ever know, really, probably. And that's going to be the right way. And then when you hear about something else, it's, wrong, it's different and maybe wrong. And so for him now, the dominant paradigm is just really weird. Yeah. Whereas if he'd gone to the centre next door, our, dominant, our paradigm would be completely weird. Both work, evidently. The question is, what, res what quality of work do you want, I suppose? You have a question, sorry. I was just wondering how um, the trainees' anxiety levels yeah. compare to using yeah. different approaches. Mm. It would be a lie to say that anxiety levels are lower, right? Um, because some people, again coming back to this point, some people simply prefer to be told what to do and to be given stuff and, and uh, that's, I'm not wanting to criticise that, they just want to learn in a different way, they want to work differently and for them it is potentially more more sort of anxiety generating, but again, very small minority of people. Um, every year, I talk to Dominic, who still leads the centre in Berlin, and we kind of compare numbers, and it generally works out that around about three people a year, I'd sit back and say, you know, I think they'd have been better off in Berlin on your course with you the way you do things and he sits down and he says pretty much the same thing I think you know, about three people a year of the hundred or so would have been better off up north in Hamburg with your way of working the rest they seem to thrive one way or the other so again comes back to the point that what I've been extolling isn't necessarily in all ways shapes and forms superior I wouldn't want to claim that but it's just different and I don't know, does that answer the question? Ish? Yeah, yeah okay. Anything else? Um, yeah, you were asking, um, you were saying about um, practice rich and you made a point um, yeah. of that most of the TP practice is actually assessed. Yeah. How much observation do you do of teaching which is not assessed? Mm. Well, we used to do, well, we, we do the six or seven hours of like minimum. Oh, hang on, sorry, ask the question again. How, how much opportunities do the teacher, the trainee get to do to teach, which is observed, but mm -hmm. not assessed? Okay, I get you. We used to be able to do more because we had multiples of five and up to 15 on the course. Now we're running multiples of six, but 12. So they get to, um, generally, if the course is full, have probably two maybe three unassessed teaching experiences uh, throughout the four weeks. Mm. I'd like to have more, but those are the time constraints and sort of time and number constraints that we're under. I would like to have more. So that's one of the reasons why we expanded the feedback and guidance stage so that we could have rehearsal. So in those two hours, they peer rehearse with each other Generally, the bits of lessons that you can control, that you're likely to stuff up when the adrenaline dump kicks in, 
which is like transitioning, setting tasks, um, certain stages that are kind of planable. And they get to just rehearse those, not so that they can do them on autopilot, but so that they can kind of become comfortable with that. And then we also sit in on those if we're asked to give them feedback uh, and tips. And in the unassessed two, three times, we also give them the choice. Do you want us to be there watching you or not? And it's 50-50 whether they ask us to come in or not. How much happens here? A bit more because we've got groups of five. Yeah. Mm. So um, yeah. I think the five, the five yeah. group system does allow for yeah. more unobserved, but we don't, we definitely don't observe it and we don't give them the option right. either. Yeah. Well, I don't anyway. I think right. most people exactly. don't. Yeah. Um, but they do get more, unless it's a 10 person course and then mm. right. it kind of slips back into the six person, mm -hmm. um, not system, yeah. but I mean, there seems to be less yeah. um, mm -hmm. unassessed. Yeah, because if you're running, say, 12, 13 candidates in a 15-person mm. model, then, yeah, you've got mm. more space there. Yeah. Well, if people drop out, yeah. then yeah. they yeah. usually they take up that NSS yeah. teaching time. And yeah. the last course I was on started as a 15, but ended up at 12. Yeah. Oh. And all three, yeah, <laughs> all three, but all three TP groups loved having yeah. the NSS mm. and did actually said openly, we, we really like it when you're not there. Yeah. I mean, in the nicest yeah. way possible, you know, yeah. we just get to practice and we get to try things out. And, yeah. and they were a really strong course. And I, yeah. I do wonder if that has something to do with it. Yeah, I think, I think the more time they have to just try things out and mm. play around without being and That's watched. actual practice. Yeah, it? exactly, the better. And also something that we do is just ask them, especially when we have the space, when we've got relatively low numbers, to say, do you want to teach that vacant slot as a group or would you like us to do it? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they say, we'd like you to do it. So, well, what would you like to see? And they say, we'd like to see you do this or try and do this or how do you do this? And then we basically try and teach to their observational interest mm -hmm. um, and then talk about it afterwards and then they give us feedback and stuff. I just checked my promise. <laughs> I lied to you. <laughs> We've overrun by three minutes, but I think we started two minutes past half. <laughs> <laughs> um, I say thank you. Thanks to International House London. Thanks to Verinda for asking me. And once again, thanks for giving me an hour of your time. I've really enjoyed it. And I hope you found something to take away that's kind of yeah, halfway stimulating. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.